Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Think Tank Thursday. I'm Candy Kelly, and I am excited to be your host for this week. Before we jump in, I have to give some love to my 2023 Think Tank sponsors. We are so grateful for their support, which allows us to bring you episodes each and every week. So let's send some love to Simnox, Redemption Plus, Roller, Betson, Delta Strike. On Thursdays, You've heard me say it, Trainertainment likes to take some time away from all of the doing and spend a little bit of time thinking in our business. Today, our guest comes from one of our lovely sponsors, um, Josh Liebman from Roller is here with us today. And today we are going to talk about how do you choose a tech stack for your family entertainment center? Um, you know, don't get... Don't get discouraged by that word. I, would, I had to ask him what exactly a tech stack meant as well. But, you know, we all run a lot of systems sometimes to get us the data that we need to help us make decisions for our business. And so are you ready to simplify all those systems? And how do you identify what the greatest option is for your particular needs? Well, he is going to join us today to discuss those questions. Um, and what you should be asking when you're looking for maybe a more simplified all-in-one platform. So let's jump in. Josh, welcome back to Think Tank Thursday. For those who may not know, take a few minutes, introduce yourself, what you do, um, kind of your history in the industry, because it's pretty long. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Candy, thanks so much for having me back. I'm excited to be back here. Uh, so my name is Josh Liebman. I am with Roller Software. Uh, to give a quick background in the industry, I've been in the uh, attractions, uh, tourism, hospitality businesses for uh, about 18 years now. Uh, early on in my career, I had the opportunity to work for organizations like Disney and Universal and Cedar Fair and Merlin and uh, got my bachelor's degree in theme parks and attractions management and my master's in hospitality and tourism. And then uh, uh, from there, had the opportunity to consult for uh, for great hospitality organizations. I was working with Ritz-Carlton, uh, Four Seasons, Waldorf Astoria, uh, and was able to actually look at you know the, the guest experience in the attractions industry very much from the lens of how are these top tier lodging operators doing that. So really kind of blending all of that together and uh, uh, bringing a lot of just uh, guest experience power, I would say, over to uh, to the attraction side. Um, even worked uh, with mystery shopping for several years of helping to uh, uh, sort of manage mystery shop accounts and help uh, help people put together a good a good audit and measurement of their uh, their guest experience. And then a couple of years ago, had the opportunity to come join the team at Roller. And uh, since I did that, about two years ago. I uh, have hosted the guest experience show, Rollers Podcast. You're familiar with it. You've been on it. Um, and I uh, get to speak at conferences and do Think Tank Thursdays like this and uh, uh, just really create a lot of content around guest experience and uh, really looking at it through the lens of technology because Roller is a technology company that focuses on, on ticket sales, on booking, on really a lot of the uh, digital aspects of the guest experience. And uh, Roller's focus is really to help remove friction from that experience to make it more convenient, which can ultimately lead to higher levels of satisfaction and loyalty. Awesome. You know, I kind of envy you because I feel like you're one of the few people that I know who from the, because you were an IAPA ambassador that like had a clear, like you knew what industry you wanted to be in and like made that happen where I've been in restaurants and then here and now coaching and training, I've been in operations, but I feel like there was never a question for you. <laughs> well, it is kind of funny because it also means that like my entire career path was decided by an 11 year old, which is when I like started really liking theme parks and roller coasters. So in, in some ways, yeah, it's good, clear focus. In some ways it's like, oh, and an 11 year old decided a, a career path for someone who's now an adult, I guess. <laughs> you build your own theme park using the Sims computer software when it first came out? Um, I was a big roller coaster tycoon. Roller coaster tycoon. That's what they were called, tycoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's some pretty successful parks on that platform. <laughs> And some awesome. unsuccessful ones too, but you know, we don't have to go down. That's how you learn. <laughs> well, today we're going to dive in because uh, Roller guest blogs on Trainertainment. And so we're going to jump into the latest one that's coming out, which is how to choose a tech stack for your family entertainment center. And I think that this discussion about technology and its advancements and 
what you should be using and not is quite interesting because I love that this industry was started on mom and pops who just kind of scrapped it together. They're grit. They're like, oh, I need to book some parties. All right, let's uh, find something to let me do that. I need to ring in some food. Let's find something to do that. And so we've operated for so many years in this system does this. This system does this. This one does this one thing over here. And then I have to export all of that into this system over here, which actually gives me my reports and all of those things. And I love that for the history of how we started as an industry, but it is frustrating in the day-to-day -day operations. I was talking to someone who told me that their client, when they first started working with them, had 13 different systems in their business. That's too many. <laughs> so, you know, now there are better options like Roller, thank goodness, that have finally come along and started putting all these things together. But what exactly do you mean by technology stack? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, really, it ties in with a, a lot of actually what you just said. And I think one of the first things really to address is don't be intimidated by the term tech stack or technology stack. That's why I wanted to break it down. Yeah, I mean, Roller is a technology company. I'm not, I don't come from a huge techie background as, you know, as we just talked about, I'm more from, from the operational side. So really breaking it down in its most simplest uh, forms is that it's the set of systems that you use that in many cases need to need to bring together, form together to allow you to complete the necessary functions for your business. So you might have... A, a piece of technology that sells tickets. You might have one that runs your food and beverage operation. You might have one that uh, that you know manages your uh, your maintenance, manages your employees, your HR systems. If all those come together, then uh, then that's your technology stack, and those are the systems that that you are using. And like you said, if you're using thirteen, well, in some cases, thirteen might not be too many, depending on the size of the business. But if it causes a lot of extra admin time, now you might be thinking, all right, my tech stack is too big. Where can we? Could we eliminate things because we maybe have certain systems that can do a lot more than just their individual functions? Um, it's interesting too, when I think about like the different tech stacks because it's an all-in-one, you know, there's the 13, what people don't understand and not to get too techy is that where we speak a language English or Spanish or French or any of those, there are like hundreds of computer languages. So as an operator, I remember thinking, why can't they just talk to each other? Or why can't they just integrate or interface with each other? And it's not that simple on the tech side of stuff because one may be running off of a Java language and one may be running off of Ruby on Rails language. And that's and like those are things that we don't know in the in the back. And why for operators we get so frustrated when we say, why can't they just work together? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And really, I think one of the one of the best sort of yardsticks here to determine, you know, is, is my tech stack too big is how much admin work are you doing that might even just be like copying, pasting spreadsheets yeah. just to, just to like convert things into a different language. I'll put in air quotes kind of to, you know, to what you were saying to sort of put it on, on all the consistent ways of how we're running the numbers, how we're looking at the numbers, how we're defining it and how we're measuring it. So if we know that a guest bought, uh, you know, X ticket, they bought this, you know, particular package that we have, do we also know that they bought a hamburger and a milkshake at our snack bar? Are, are, are those the same systems? Or as far as your tech stack is concerned, those might be two completely separate guests, which sort of, I would say, limits your ability, your ability to, to understand your guest and who's, who's doing what, who's buying what, and then, you know, even tying it in with, you know, with their perceptions and their overall feedback as well. Um, now, Roller does, um, is one of the, Kabul, like I said, has come out as an all-in-one platform. And I won't say it will do everything in the world, but it does a whole lot of what we need in this industry. So you want to break down some of the things that you guys have compiled under one system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I apologize in advance if, if I miss a few because there are you know, so many features, but really starting looking at, at the core functions of your business, selling tickets, uh, booking sessions online, booking birthday parties, paying for birthday parties. Uh, many uh, uh, FECs and, and particularly trampoline parks that require waivers, having that as part of the system as well, tying that in with the guest data is extremely useful, extremely beneficial. Um, being able to tie in uh, food and beverage sales, uh, being able to connect it with CRM and marketing platforms. And then one of the things that uh, that I think is 
is one of Roller's greatest features. And I'm a little biased because we we talked about guest feedback on a, on a previous yeah. thing. That is, is, your is, how, is how the GX score, which is the survey function, all connects with it as well. So, I mean, there's, I, I mean, there's like a million different survey platforms out there. You can use many of them are free. They're super easy, but kind of like what I was saying earlier of, if you've got those separate systems, it doesn't know who that guest is. So either you're not going to get that information or you're going to require the guest to say, what's your name? What's your email address? What day did you visit and get all that info, which you would then need to manually now sync back with your ticket. But if you think of it like Uber, when you get out of an Uber and you're prompted for that survey, Uber knows the driver, Uber knows the ride, Uber knows how much you just spent, and it knows all your history as well. So kind of just using that as an analogy, having the survey function, which for Roller is called the guest experience score or GX score for short, uh, tying that with all the other data in the system, now you're just getting so much more intelligence about your business, about your guests that uh, that just allow you to, to do so much from a marketing standpoint and even from investing in new attractions and experiences. One thing that an online platform really can help with is we all know that there's a lot of data that we can collect, but collecting data for data's sake, what does it do for you? Train entertainment teaches in our business coaching that if we're going to look at data or some key performance indicators or a scorecard, whatever frame a terminology you want to use, uh, we're not just c collecting it for vanity reasons. Like it needs to motivate you. It needs to, uh, you know, let you know you need to change your behavior or dig in deeper to find what's going on. Um, and so it will be, it's so much easier to do that if you can get all of your data in one place. And it is also linked to other parts of data. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, just, you know, one example that I can give you and kind of tying in the, you know, the guest experience score. Uh, if you're looking at, at all your survey scores and you're trying to understand guest satisfaction, let's say you're looking at like a block of, of survey responses for a month and you got, you know, a, a 4.6 out of five. It's like, great. Like, that's really good. Like, it's like a 92%. So it's like we get an A, right? But what does that really mean? Like where, where were the scores the best, but also where did they dip as well? So now like, can you break that out and say, here are the survey scores from people who visited on Tuesday afternoon. And here are the people who visited Saturday evening. Well, actually we've got a very different experience here. Uh, you, as, as you might see, right. Off peak times, peak times. Yep. And then even looking at it and say, well, what, you know, what team members did they interact with? You know, this person scanned them in, this person, uh, you know, sold them at, at their concessions. So now we're able to actually link guest satisfaction or dissatisfaction to the other components of the guest's visit without the guest needing to actively say, I came on a Tuesday at 3 p.m. and it was great because there were no lines. They might say, hey, it was great. There were no lines. But if you don't have that other data, then you're, you're just seeing... Oh, there were no lines, but now another response says the lines were too long. So how do we actually differentiate and really understand what that guest experience is, uh, which then allows us to actually, you know, to, you know, take action on it. Very cool. So let's say someone's ready to not have 13 systems running their business and wants to start the research process of like looking into some all-in-one platforms. What are some of the questions that they should be asking and analyzing as they're looking at to what platform they choose? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say like what what are the business needs that you have? So usually selling and mission is, you know, is very much uh uh, you know, part of part, part of the process within the attractions industry. So, you know, how how is it powering ticket sales and really even looking at the functionality of it? Is it easy for the guests to use? And then on the back end side, is it easy to, you know, to understand the data, to get the reporting, to be able to even configure the system? Uh, another question, and, and I know I, I briefly mentioned waivers earlier, uh, oh. is the waiver functionality, is it is it tied in? Is it user friendly? Does it, uh, does it link with the ticket data as well? So if I know that a guest has bought, uh, you know, a one hour session at the trampoline park that they have also signed the waiver and that, you know, I, I don't need to look in two places for that and link them together. It's already there. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up guest feedback again, because it's, you know, it's, it's, you a, don't want us to carry clipboards anymore and pens and paper. You have all those filing cabinets in the back office and where's the key? You gotta keep them locked, right? Like there's, there's yeah. so much administrative uh, frustration <laughs> that you just, you just don't need to have that anymore. If you want to have that, great. But you know, if you don't, you don't need to have that. Um, and, and then memberships as well is, you know, is another component. It's been very big in the trampoline park space. Uh, and now we're seeing it more and more with, with FECs. There are definitely, 
uh, some types of venues and attractions where memberships are, I would say, more applicable are going to be more valuable than than some others. Uh, but knowing if membership can be part of your your overall system, and then another thing too, because you made a point of saying an all in one system. Uh, you know, can it do every single thing in the world? Well, you might think of some other things that might be outside of its capabilities. So you want to know, am I able to connect those very easily so that all the frustration and and sort of the, the data transfer back and forth, that that can be done seamlessly. So that's called an open API for those who aren't, you know, overly tech savvy uh, to be able to, to link to other systems and then be able to, to transfer that data, which ultimately... Can make it easier for the guest, and you know, could make them easier to make it easier for for them to spend more money, um, or could be easier to market to them, and uh, and of course easier on the back end as well. So a lot of what we're talking about is is uh, uh, trying to eliminate some of that that back end frustration and that admin time. And I want to make uh, a point for everyone, and can, just to change a different perspective and how people think about things. Sometimes, sometimes people look at these things and say, well, the cost is more to switch over or to do this or to do that. But you've mentioned a lot of things that also have cost involved. They just may not be what we look at as hard costs. Admin duty. How much wasted time are we doing in like filing away or scanning in waivers or whatever it may be? Um, how much do we have to pay someone by hour who may be, be a bookkeeper who's having to pull reports from different places and then put it in one place so that you can know your P&L and how you're doing and all of those things. And so I know those things don't always, we're not looking at them as the cost involved with that, but there are costs involved with having to pull from so many different things. Yeah. And even, you know, if you extend beyond kind of the, the admin or the, the bookkeeping time, uh, just look at your labor. I mean, our industry has been going through massive labor challenges the last few years. If you can have something that can reduce uh, some of the frontline staff that you might need to be able to, to give them more tools to be able to be more efficient and better serve the guest, then that's going to substantially save on, on the labor needed to run the business. And that can be from, you know, uh, reducing the number of staff members you have at the entry point who are selling tickets. You can, uh, you know, it, it can be uh, uh, reducing the number of people that you might have on your sales team who are booking groups and events and birthday parties. So it can be efficiency the too, if everything's connected and I'm not having to go find the waiver in system A to connect it to the ticket fell in system B, and I can then process three different people in the amount of time it used to take me to do that. Well, I don't want to use many people to process my front line because I'm triple as fast. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there's the there's the labor and the cost reduction from that standpoint. And then think of the revenue generating possibilities that you have with it. If you've got a membership that is automatically uh, connected with your booking system, then think of just what I was, you know, we were talking about earlier, where if the survey functionality has all the data from the guest, well, now the member functionality is all the data from the guest too. And we know who bought a standard admission and we know their email address. So now we can very easily push that out to them that said, hey, thanks for visiting. We're glad you had a great time. You gave us a five-star review in the GX score. We'd love for you to, you know, be, you know, become part of our member family or whatever hospitable verbiage you want to use with that. Uh, <laughs> and push that out to them all, you know, all automatically, seamlessly. You don't have someone, you know, making phone calls. You're sending a lot on, on postcards and you know, whatever you might be sending out in the mail to, you know, to get people to upgrade, to get people to uh uh, to book again, or if you've got their birthdays and you know their ages, then well, now you can start, you know, automatically doing drip campaigns for birthday parties that uh, that connect with with the data that you're getting from your system. So, reduce costs, increase revenue. You know, ultimately, yes, if the cost is a little bit higher, then it's important to think about well, how much more value is it actually giving to the business and and the opportunity to actually grow our profit margin. Yeah. Yeah, definitely wanted to add that side note because I just feel like sometimes people get caught up in just the price tag sometimes and not thinking more critically about everything else it affects in a business. Um, so looking at all own platforms, those are some great questions you came. I have some follow-up questions though. Um, trend of virtual payments. So how important is it to be able to take Apple Pay and Google Pay and how much more important do you think it will be in the future? Uh very and very, I would say. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, think of it this way. I, you know, I, I know that I personally have embraced Apple Pay in, in the last few years. I don't think I was exactly like an early adopter to it, but I mean, it's been around for I feel like almost ten years or so now. It, it seems like probably the it's the first. Good to note because it's not some newfangled technology that you don't want to get behind yet. It it has been out there for some time. 
Exactly. <laughs> and, and let me let me just sort of kind of present this scenario. So you you have kids, right? You're a mom. Right? I have to. So, yeah. uh, so if let's say kids are asleep, you're on the couch watching Netflix and also scrolling Instagram at the same time, because we all do that. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just going to assume that you do that because we all do that, right? <laughs> you might come across an ad for, for a venue, for a family entertainment center. Maybe you'd heard of it before. Maybe you've driven by, maybe a, a friend went there and it was just sort of, uh, th there was, you know, some form of awareness uh, or maybe you hadn't heard of it and th there's a very compelling ad. You click into it and then you very quickly can actually get to the purchase page. And then with that, you're able to actually make the purchase with Apple Pay or with Google Pay without having to pause Netflix, get up off the couch, go get your wallet, pull out your credit card, type in all those credit card numbers, the little security code, that three digit one on the back, put the card back in your wallet, put it away, go back to the couch, complete the transaction, unpause Netflix, and then go on with your night. You just did all that by just clicking and, you know, I, I have an iPhone, so just click face ID, boom, done. Don't even have to pause Netflix. So all of it happens without any disruption to your life. So if you think about, uh, you know, even something like paying with a credit card, we don't necessarily think of that as a friction point. We also don't necessarily think of that as being part of the guest experience. But you should. And when I say we, I just mean sort of sort yeah. of collectively, all of us, if we can't see the guest who's in front of us, then how can we deliver the experience? Well, think about that guest whose kids are in bed, sitting on the couch, watching Netflix, scrolling Instagram, and they stumble upon some form of communication, advertising, marketing, whatever it is for your venue. Can they decide right there to book? And can they do that without any other interruption to their evening at that point? And let's point? be honest. We're talking about parents because we cater towards families a lot of times. If we're finally sitting on the couch after running to practice and whatever other extracurricular and cooking dinner and getting them down and bath night and all of those things, you're going to ask me to get up. I'm just going to say, I'll do that later. I'll check into that tomorrow. I'll remember to do it then. And then I might not come back. Right, exactly. So being able to, to sort of capture the transaction at the peak of interest, uh, you know, that the guests sitting on your couch, on their couch on Tuesday night, that is part of your guest experience. We, we can't see them, but we need to, we need to think about, uh, you know, can this guest do this super easily? So uh, something like Apple Pay or, you know, or, or Google Pay, they allow you to, to do that. And then uh, kind of tying in, you know, the other, the other benefits of, you know, we, we sort of talked about like the all-in-one system and reducing costs, increasing revenue. All of that was actually without increasing attendance. So now tie in these other forms of payments. Now we're actually talking about the difference between a guest coming and a guest, like you said, maybe I'll get to it later. And maybe yeah. I'll. Um, the, and I think it's easy now because it has been around for it. Just talk to your payment processor. If you're interested in adding, um, being able to accept Apple Pay or Google Pay, it's a conversation with their processor. And I'm sure it's not that difficult of a process any longer. Right. I just see yeah. it on so many things now. So um, you talked about waivers too. If you're a business, a location that needs waivers to make sure that they function in a way that you need them to. And I loved this in your blog. You said that waivers really should have two primary functions and you should think about both of them. So I want you to lay that out because I think people know the first one, but I don't know if people think about the second one. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, first and foremost, the purpose of a waiver is for liability. So we can we can kind of check that box and say it's, you know, it's it's necessary. Some might look at it as a necessary evil, but it can actually be a very necessary benefit that can really enhance your business and enhance your operation in a number of ways. If your waivers are tied directly back to your tickets, and I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, is that you now have the guest who bought you know, a session and, you know, we can use a trampoline park for, you know, for example, they booked a, a 60 minute session or a 90 minute session. So now you know what day and what time they're coming. And now they've signed the waiver and that's linked directly back to their ticket. So when the guest arrives, they sign a waiver, you no longer need to think of these as two separate things. Here are the guests who have, who have booked, you know, sessions, jump times, you know, whatever that is. And here are the guests who have signed waivers. Now that's all linked directly together. So this can substantially help to, uh, to really reduce the queues at your point of entry, especially if they've done that in advance. So they can go on, they can, they can book their session, pay for it, and then 
boom, immediately sign the waiver. And guess what? They still haven't unpaused, they still haven't paused Netflix, right? It's like, it's <laughs> right? they're able to, to knock that out and, and accomplish all of it. So when they've, when they've gotten there, the hurdle for the guest no longer needs to happen. Now, in some cases it, you know, you want to be prepared for those guests to walk in who, well, A, are, you know, are still like, they might be booking on site. They might be, you know, a, a walk-in guest, or they just haven't signed the waiver yet. Uh, kiosks are, are a way to really help to eliminate that as well. So you're able to really kind of segment your guests into here are the guests that are good to go. They're ready in one line and you're just scanning them in, confirm their ticket purchase, confirm their waiver. And then if they need to, you know, segment other guests off to uh, whether it's booking or whether it's uh, completing waivers that they're able to do that uh, pretty efficiently as well. So uh, I'll also add in a third one as well. And the reason it uh, wasn't necessarily included in the blog is because it's um, it's less operational and more marketing, but it ties in directly with the amount of data that you were collecting with your guests that give you the opportunity to better serve your guest and better market to your guest. So if you know and I, I kind of touched on this a, a little bit earlier, but if you know your guests' birthdays, well, now you can sync that with your your CRM, your customer relationship management uh, uh, initiatives to push that out at you know at a month, month and a half advance to say you're turning eight, you know, coming up, uh, you, you should have your birthday party here. So um, obviously, you don't say it directly like that, but you know, you put that in. <laughs> Come here, right? uh, but you put that in, you start to really get the guest uh, engaged to, you know, to book a party. So now you've got a guest who visited as as a uh, as just a, a general admission guest, and now you're able to to keep that conversation going, get them in a birthday party. That, that's just one example of of many that uh, just gives you the the data to better serve and better market to your guest. You know, speaking about birthdays, particularly, I. And one of those, like my, if in today's world, my dentist office can send me a text on my birthday. Well, I really think that the place that specializes in birthday parties should probably send me some a message on my birthday too. Are you saying <laughs> you can go to the dentist on your birthday? No, <laughs> but I get a text that says happy birthday from Villarica Family Dentistry. And so like, they don't care about birthdays, but if they can recognize a birthday, that's what we do specialize in. We should be recognizing birthdays as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> um, my next question, you know, you brought up memberships and I think memberships have evolved so much. Um, in my first days of operations, we literally had a punch card that we sold for a flat price. Like, and so if you bought the card in advance, like I think you saved 30% off of what it was. And then each time you came, we punched it out when it was all done, like we sold you another card. That's kind of, you were pre-buying and what it was was pre-buying X number of visits to come to the facility. And then technology came and then, um, and also there's some confusion I feel between membership and loyalty. So mm -hmm. There's not a right answer here. I just want to pick your brain about how significant do you believe membership programs are for the future of our industry? First, how long do we have? We just want to talk about the difference between membership and loyalty. But uh, maybe that's actually to... not a title, uh, another think tank for us. What is the difference? <laughs> we and absolutely do. as well. Uh, but to kind of, uh, you know, touch on, I would say. Uh, you know, if, if you look at the the punch card example that you just gave and sort of bringing that to today and even really thinking out into the future, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, you know, I, I have I have a lot of, of, of feelings and opinions on, on the subject. And, you know, the technology is, is out there to really help make your membership program become very robust. So, you know, in the past, it could be, you know, the punch card where you buy X amount of visits. Uh, if you lose the punch card, I'm guessing sorry, we'd love yep. to sell another punch we card, right? So, to track it, so automatically some friction kind of in, in that <laughs> process right there. Uh, but additionally too, uh, you know, memberships have also kind of been synonymous with annual passes or season passes. You're looking in the, the theme park industry and in, in theme and amusement parks or water parks. And then uh, over in cultural tourism, zoos, museums, and aquariums, uh, have, have been calling them memberships, but they've been identical to, you know, annual passes or, or season passes. Uh, but the, the model is very similar where it's X amount of dollars per year you pay up front. And usually the ideal pricing model is around, you know, two and a half times your, you know, your general admission ticket. So you say it pays for itself in three visits. Uh, and then when that 
you know, when that month, when that day, you know, comes around the next year, they you get that postcard in the mail. That actually kind of feels like you have to book a dentist appointment, but it's time to <laughs> renew your membership or renew your pass, right? Uh, and then, you know, in the last, I would say 15, maybe 15 plus years or so is when kind of flexible payment options sort of sort of came into play. Uh, and, and I was working at, uh, you know, at Universal in the guest services team, uh, uh, kind of when, when that sort of first became very popular and the guests would have to enter into a contract. They'd have to actually sign like several, uh, you know, documents of just, I'm going to pay X amount of dollars per month. Um, people abused that system, not just, you know, universal but all over to say like, I can get an annual pass for $17 and then I can just cancel it. Or, uh, you know, people would say I'm, you know, visiting for six weeks and, you know, I'm going to use it every single day and then I'm going to cancel it. So then they changed it of, you know, now you need the down payment and that's, you know, the same as one day's admission. So regardless, it, it started to get very complicated, but where we're at today and Roller can really help do this is you, you enter into a, a monthly agreement with the guest. And in many cases, it requires a, a minimum commitment of perhaps it's 90 days and, you know, it, you know, that can be very flexible. Uh, where the price, the monthly price for the membership is a very attractive amount, where maybe it's a little bit more than a one day pass, but it's that amount per month. And then you get unlimited visits per year. You don't worry about having to renew it at, you know, at the end of the year. It's not that same type of contract as, you know, as the guest who would have to go up to the guest services window at the theme park and sign, you know, I, my life away, the guests, I'm going to pay $17 a month. And then I have to write a letter if I'm going to cancel it or, you know, or, or whatever it is. Uh, but it gives them a lot more flexibility. Um, by doing that, you end up kind of achieving what is sort of kind of, I, I, I've mentioned Netflix a couple of times, but this subscription economy that now, if I can say, Hey, I, you know, the, the FEC or the trampoline park is now just part of my monthly expense with the memberships that I'm getting for my family. It, uh, you know, it, it helps to, it helps to drive loyalty. Loyalty is done through, through the guest experience through, you know, through what happens on site. Uh, but it makes it much more convenient for the guest to be a recurring member and use that membership, uh, you know, as, you know, as they like. So, I think that is where a lot of the industry is going. I think we're very much at, at the cusp of a lot of areas of the attractions industry and kind of the venue types that I mentioned of really embracing, um, not even, I mean, embracing the technology, but embracing the the business model of, you know, we just want to be part of your monthly expenses. And that with that, we're going to give you all these benefits, these discounts on food and beverage. We want to give you discounts on on admission when you're bringing new guests. Uh, you know, some places offer discounts on memberships for, you know, for their friends and families to help really the advocacy effect grow. And then you spin that flywheel. So now, uh, now you've got more predictable revenue coming in for the business. And you have guests who who now see it as kind of a, um, kind of a third space, right? You've got, you've got work or school, you've got home, and then what's your third space? For many people, it might be a coffee shop. Uh, but for many people, it could be the FEC or the trampoline park. Um. So confession time, I have a membership to Six Flags. Yeah. Haven't been since Christmas of 2020. And I got to play it every single month. Yeah. Um, but when I think about canceling it, it's like, ah, but you get to bring free friends and family, like with your membership, when you don't always get that with their season pass. So that is one of those that has both that annual pass type thing and then a membership. And I'm in Georgia. So our Six Flags is open quite a lot of the year because of the weather here. And so because it would be more and I can take my daughters for free with the membership, I just haven't canceled it, even though I don't use it. Yeah. So confession time. Uh, I had my Six Flags membership for several years, hadn't used it since 2019, maybe even 18. And uh, earlier this year, we thought we were going to be moving out of state. So I canceled it. And then when that plan got canceled, I thought, oh, man. Now I don't have the membership anymore. So now I wish I could I could go and renew it, but I might have to might have to restart the process. <laughs> um, yeah. The other thing I just want to point out about what you're saying is that when you people have already 
bought or it's part of their monthly expenses or their monthly bills. It even worked back in the day when, with the punch card, like I said, when people pre-bought that, we found that if, for the few that we could track because they were regulars, they ended up spending more money when they walked through the door because the psychology of that visit was different. They had not already pulled out their wallet or any type of payment source at all for that visit. So when their kid asked for the ice cream or the icy or for more arcade money or whatever, they were more willing to give it because to them, it was a free visit. It's not free. They already paid for it. Exactly. Yep. I mean, 100%. I mean, the more uh, that ties in with memberships, that ties in with advanced bookings, uh, you know, the the more that you're able to uh, to get the guest to pay for in advance, whether it is a membership or even even a general admission, uh, they walk in feeling like their wallet's full again. And so you, you have a substantial advantage for the ancillary spending. Yep. Um, well, as always, you have brought a wealth of knowledge. Um, we end all Think Tank Thursdays with our signature question, which you've answered several times, but you are great in bringing me different answers every time, so I love it. Um, but you ready for this one? I'm ready. What do you do on a regular basis to grow yourself? So one of the things uh, that I've been thinking about lately is, uh, is the 1% rule. And if you think about, even if you just take, you know, the number one and you add 1% to that, you end up with 1.01. .01. But if let's say you were to do that every single day, you end up really having a, a compounding impact of growth. So you could look at that, whether it's, you know, whether it's money or whether it's a, a skill or something that's not as tangible or, or as quantitative, but to think like, if, if I can grow this by 1% every single day, uh, it'll double after 70 days and it'll increased by 37 times over the course of a year. So uh, I, I try to think of that in, in whatever it is that, that I'm doing, um, because it really breaks it down into uh, celebrating small wins and achievements. It's, you know, it, it, I've, I've been trying to learn piano for the last year or so. And it's something like that. It's like that in and of itself is, is just so, um, uh, it seems so lofty, but it's like, if I can just improve my skill set by 1% today, based on where I'm at, then I know that I'm going to achieve that compounding effect and get closer to my goal. That's awesome. Um, this is, it's funny. I, I feel like I should go read this book again because you're like the second conversation I've had this week where someone has talked about the 1%. Have you read Raving Fans? Uh, by uh, Ken... Ken Blanchard and somebody else, I believe. Yes. Uh, yes, I believe I have. It's been a little while though, but yeah, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I think I've got it on there. Yeah. <laughs> one of the big, there's three, um, shields that you're supposed to get. And, that, and like one of the big ones there is like one, the 1% rule in there. And so it's been brought up twice this week to me where someone has talked about the 1%. So that's something in the world is telling me I need to go revisit that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I feel validated knowing that you talked about it earlier this week as well. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Josh, if people want to learn more about Roller, about you, um, just connect, just be friends with you and network you, with you because you're an awesome guy, where would you send them? <laughs> well, please connect with me. Please be friends with me. Uh, if you want to learn about Roller, you can go to roller.software. From there, you can uh, connect with someone from our sales team and you can get a demo. You can learn more about the platform there. Uh, to get a hold of me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Josh Liebman, or uh I'm on Twitter as well, Joshua underscore Liebman. Feel free to reach out, say hi, and uh, and yeah, definitely connect. Yes, you have an affinity for networking. I have listened to a podcast where you talked about how much you love networking. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, connect and reach out. Well, thank you for spending your time with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. Thank you again to Josh for always being so giving of his time and sharing his expertise with us. I hope that you guys took a lot of notes about what questions to ask the next time you might be looking for uh, the next system for your business. Thank you to all of you for choosing to spend your Thursdays with us. We're, in, we're eternally grateful for that. Thank you to my 2023 um, Think Tank sponsors. And then if you have an idea for Think Tank, do you want to be a guest on Think Tank or would you like to sponsor an episode? You can email me, candy at trainertainment.net. We'd love to talk about that. Be sure to check us out anytime you're looking for online, on-site, or ongoing training and coaching. We are the people who would love to help you grow your people so you can grow your business. Until next week, bye.
Introducing Mobile Wallet, the next gen and cashless fueled by Embed. Your virtual game card is added to the mobile wallet with no app download required. Just scan the QR code, then create your account in the mobile portal. Guests can do a quick reload of their game cards anytime, anywhere without leaving the game. They can also skip the kiosk and cashier lines and there's no need for a balance check machine. With advanced security and encrypted tech, Embed's mobile wallet is the only FEC business solution compliant and approved by both Google and Apple.